else, if you would, take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 15. And uh, this morning, I'm going to tell you, there's not, there's not going to be some new concept that you're going to find in the scripture. Uh, I'm, this is the story of the prodigal son. For some of you, I know you know this story inside and out, upside and down. But I want to spend a little time with you uh, just talking about some things that have to do with this story in relation to the, 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 our Heavenly Father. And anytime I get a chance to brag on Jesus and brag on God, it's a good thing. Uh, we on a regular basis need to brag on Jesus Christ in our own life and about how great he is. Uh, I'm going to say a few things about it this morning, but I realize there's some of you sitting here today uh, that you can't say I had a good father, and I understand that. Some of you, um, I understand, you, you may even try to cover up for him. You may even try to make it where people don't know how bad they were. Uh, that happens. But when we talk about God, I want you to know something. He's always a good father. And even though you may not understand everything about him, he's still a good father. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about some things about the advantage of the prodigal. And uh, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute, okay? But let's look at Luke, Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. If you're there, would you say amen? amen? All right. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that follow to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Can I just stop right there and say, isn't it kind of unusual for a son to go to his father and say, listen, I want you to give me my inheritance now, and then go and use it. I'm going to go use it, blow it. (laughs) And more than that, for the father to agree to it. Isn't that a little bit unusual? Wouldn't you think that'd be kind of, you know, that's a, you know, maybe a bad decision by dad here, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> Verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. This is about the prodigal son, and the prodigal son goes and spends all his money, and then disaster hits. Isn't that the way it always works? It doesn't work out the thing way you thought it was. You're going to win the lottery, so you're going to spend $100. Now you don't have the $100, and you didn't win the lottery. That's the way it works. Amen. Verse, uh, verse 15. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. So he goes and joins up with a farmer there, and the farmer puts him to work feeding his hogs. It says, and though he would have fain, he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Isn't that amazing? No man gave unto him. Nobody felt sorry for him. Nobody, he stood on the street corner with his sign. God bless, please help. Anything helps, hungry, and nobody gave anything to him. Maybe it's because they knew he could work. Have a nice day. I said that smiling so you can't get mad at me. Amen. Verse uh, 17, and when they came, when he came to himself, it's like he's in a stupor. He's like he can't think straight. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Okay. Now I want you to see the principle. He's going to go back to the father. Okay. He's going to repent of his sin. Okay. Then you get the father's reaction. After he says, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and verse 19, am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. That's the attitude of the prodigal. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Aren't you glad that's the reaction of the father? That when you get ready to get right with God and you say, okay, I'm done with my sin. I want, I want to go back to the Father. That the moment you take a step in his direction, he sees that. And you're maybe a great way off. He'll still come right to you. Amen? Amen. That's our God. The Bible says, and he rose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of the story, but basically the older brother hears about it. He gets mad because after all, dad's never done anything for him and he didn't leave and blow his inheritance. And at the end of the passage here, what you're seeing is, is the Lord's teaching what he started with in the very beginning of this passage in verse one, he's talking to a bunch of Pharisees who believe that because of their good works, God ought to be nice to them. That's their mindset. And I believe there's a lot of Christians like that today who think that because if they do good things, that God owes them something. If I be good, God will give me his blessings. And I'm just going to tell you, none of us are good. And if you get his blessings, it's just because he loves you. And he doesn't love you because you're good. He loves you because he loves you. Boy, I wish I could get that across to some of you sitting here right now. You think that because you're bad, God doesn't love you. I'm telling you, God loves you despite the fact that you're bad. Amen. And that no matter how hard you try to be good, that doesn't increase or decrease his love. Amen. You need to know that this morning. I want you to go to the Lord in prayer with me, and then we're going to go and we'll get into the message. Father, thank you for your book, and thank you, Lord, for being our heavenly Father. And we want to honor you and glorify you and let you know we love you, and we're thankful for you. We know without you, we could do nothing. We know without you, Lord, we'd have no place to call heaven our home, Lord. We'd have no forgiveness. Lord, you hold our breath in your hands. We know it's you that gives us life, gives us the breath we have, gives us the abilities that we have. Even to the simplest tasks, we know it's because of your blessings upon us. We thank you for being a good father. Lord, for loving us and doing what's best for us, Lord. By sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, thank you for adopting us into your family. Lord, I pray for anybody here today. Lord, if there's anybody lost, I pray they'd get saved. Lord, thank you that you're willing to forgive us because Jesus paid the cost. And Lord, if there's any Christian here today that's struggling, going through a hard time, trying to, Lord, they don't understand their standing in Christ, that their sins are forgiven and that there's a heavenly father who loves them who will help them through this life if they'll just leave the hog pen and come back to you. Lord, I pray today they'd leave the hog pen. They'd come to themselves and come back to the Father, I pray. Lord, help me to present Jesus Christ. Help me to present you correctly this morning. There's nothing wrong with anything that I'm talking about. The problem is me. Help me to think straight. Help me to be able to, Lord, get out of the way that you might be able to use me for your glory and honor. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was raised in a Christian home. I will, and I'm thank God for that. I was raised in a Christian home. My dad was a, 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 a man who loved God. Uh, and when I was about three years old, three or four years old, he went to Bible college, Bible school, and uh, he learned the Bible and he became uh, uh, basically a, a pastor. But he, te- he, the way his testimony is, is he talks about how that he volunteered and said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And God's used him over the years. My dad's a, a martial arts instructor. He's a, a Shotokan karate instructor. He's a jujitsu instructor. He's a judo instructor. You say, now? Right now. Down in uh, Tyler, Texas, in Nacogdoches, he's working with two or three colleges trying to get two or three classes together. You say, why is that important? Well, because my dad, what he does is he gets an influence on those people and then gives them a gospel track and tries to lead them to Christ. And over the years, the consequence of that has been two or three people that have not only gotten saved, but become preachers and pastors and all kinds of stuff. That's what God does. He takes what you have and uses it. And I feel sorry for any punk who messes him in the grocery store line to this day. <laughs> but usually what was home life like? Well, we had something called family altar where we all got our Bibles and sat around together and read the Bible and prayed and talked to each other. And it created a great blessing. We learned the Bible. And I believe that is a great, great, great key in having a good family. At Christmas time, dad taught us to love one another and to give to each other. He gave us a hundred dollars and he said, this is your job. You pick a name. We pick names. And he said, your job is to get the person you picked 
the biggest gift. You spend the most money on them. And then you buy everybody else a gift with the amount of money you had left. Back in the day, $100 would do a pretty good job of that. Nowadays, you can barely buy anybody a Christmas gift hardly for 100 bucks. But dad was always joking around. Dad always jokes around. There's not a joke. You can't say hardly anything without my dad finding some way to joke about it. He's just that kind of guy. He is the king of dad jokes. He knows three stooges by heart. <laughs> That's my dad. <laughs> But my dad taught me to be a man. And what he taught me was, is the measure of a man is what it takes to make him quit. He said, a man is a male who shows up to do the job of a man when a man is needed. That's a great statement. There's a lot of males who won't show up to do what a man's supposed to do whenever a man's needed. Just because you're a male doesn't make you a man. Amen? There's a lot of of males who won't be men nowadays. And we need some men. The Bible said in Matthew chapter 7, my dad quoted this often. He said, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? And I can testify to you today that my dad is a giver of good gifts. Over the years, I've heard the testimony of a lot of people uh, who have been in a place of degradation in their life with so many troubles and the destruction of family. They've had broken families. I've heard people say the best upbringing is a Christian upbringing. I believe that. I believe that's true. Uh, I know some people that they say, I wish I could have had that. I've heard people say that the terrible scars of the wildlife are the evidence of how terrible it is and that fun and happiness was only temporary out there in the world because when sin catches up to you, it'll cost you more than you want to pay and keep you longer than you want to stay. I do believe that statement. I know this, I would much rather have, I, after being in the ministry for several years, after watching people and trying to help people, it's a whole lot easier to get in when you're young. You have a whole lot less baggage to carry than when you get older. And as you get older, the older, older you are when you get saved, the harder it is to break the bad habits. I know this, I know that uh, the older you get, the harder it is to live for the Lord. And the best home are those that the father has learned to love the Lord, who's and guard that relationship with the Lord, where he loves the Lord more than he loves anybody else. And he guards that relationship more than any other relationship with his very life, because he knows it affects every single thing else around him. If that father doesn't care about the word of God and doesn't care about Jesus, it affects his attitude, it affects his outlook. You, you get to a place, if you read this passage in Luke chapter 15, the Bible says he came to himself. The reason why is because his mental case was a mess. He had gone off the rails. He couldn't think straight. He had to come to himself. Why is that? Because I'll tell you what happens whenever you get away from God, you make bad decisions. You think you're making good decisions, but it's like somebody who has lo- who's low on oxygen and you put things in front of them. They don't know what to do with it. The, man, the, best, the best homes are those who, where a man falls in love with a woman and, he, and they both find the same position where they love God with all their heart and they get married in a clean, and, and they're clean and they're right. And one day a baby comes into the world and a father purposes to raise that child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And he and his wife together show that child a love that only, only God could make in them. I was talking to a man here recently. He's talking about how that his, he's fixing, his wife's fixing to have their first child. And he says, I have no idea how I'm going to feel about this baby. He said, I love my dogs. I said, you're going to, you have no idea the amount of love that you're going to have that's so much greater than anything else when that baby comes. And I think you men can say amen to that, can't you? When that baby's born, that child has, the, that, that child has a, a, a father and mother that love them. There's an advantage in this world when mom and dad love God. But I want you to see some things in this message, that, the, how, the, how the prodigal son had an advantage. We know the story, read it many times. I'm sure many of you know the story, how that, the fa- this father has two sons, a younger son, an older son, obviously, and uh, he, th- this younger son is described, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but you might write down Proverbs chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. And you could read about a foolish son. You can read about that in that passage. Uh, he's without discretion. He's lured by the sweet words of this old world. Uh, he's fooled by the movable steps of the worldly wise. That's this prodigal son. The prodigal son probably had some magazines or some, in today's world, it wouldn't be magazines, it'd be TikTok videos. 
videos, <laughs> uh, things that he saw from the far country. Things that mom and dad didn't know anything about that he was listening to and watching and it was alluring him. And uh, he, of course, he didn't, he's never seen somebody who is in uh, the uh, flex zone at Pueblo uh, or at uh, Parkview Hospital. He never saw anybody coming off of drugs, screaming and puking their guts up in some uh, bathroom in a convenience store. He never seen any of that, see, because that's not what the world shows you as their good time, do they? He's fooled by those movable steps and he's warned by the word of God, by his father, no doubt. I wonder, I wonder what his father had said to him about the far country. He despises the reproof of his teachers and maybe, uh, you know, rolls his eyes when his father says something to him and, and doubts his Sunday school teacher and, and sits with his arms crossed in church and says, what does this preacher know anyway? He's consumed by his fleshly desires and his lusts and his, before long he's ready to uh, leave the father and take his entire her- inheritance and spend the whole thing. He didn't think like you old folks think in here. Some of you old folks in here, you know the value of saving money. You know there's coming a day where something's all going to happen and you're going to have to have some money set aside. This young man's desire was to go to the far country and what he does is he blows it. He goes to the nearest marijuana shop that he can find and gets as much as he can get and blows his brains out on fries his mind on fentanyl and all the drugs that he can get. He wastes his years and wastes his body and wastes his abilities. And then after he's wasted everything, he is rejected by everybody that he was trying to fit in with. Listen to me, folks. Listen to me. Quit trying to fit in with this world. Quit trying to. They're not, going to. they're not going to receive you if you're going to follow Jesus Christ. If you try to fit in with them, you won't fit in with God's people. Amen. <laughs> if you won't fit in with God's people, you want to fit in with God's people, you're not going to fit in with the world. <laughs> that lost, this lost man, this, or this young man tried to fit in with this world, and eventually whatever he ran out with of the things that he could do for them, they dropped him like a hot rock, and nobody would give unto him and help him out. The best thing you can do is burn the bridges to the world and say, okay, I'm going forward for Jesus Christ. I could care less about anything in this world. Some of you don't want to listen to me. That's okay. You'll find out, but you'll find out too late. You'll find out where you're slopping the hogs. The younger son finds his way himself uh, all the way into that evil. He finds himself uh, in a hog pen where his life, his, he could say this, <clears throat> my life stinks. And in every way it was true. <laughs> Because he was feeding the hogs. You know what the blessing is in verse 17 is? Is that he woke up. That's the blessing. I think there are a lot of sons in the father's house today, so to speak, in God's house. Sons, Christians, who think that if they go to the far country, they might get the the attention of the prodigal. I've seen a lot of young people who are raised in Christian homes who wonder, I wonder if I could go out there and do all those things that I've been told not to do. I, I could always come back. But I'm going to tell you what the problem is with going to the far country. The far country consumes a whole lot more people than make it back to the father. That's the problem. The prodigal son, he went to the far country and thank God the story is that he got to come back to the father. But I want you to know that as a, as a, as a prodigal, they, you may hear the sweet words that drop as a honeycomb from some people you're trying to fit in with and you're trying to get some people as attention that you don't need to get their attention of. But I'll just tell you the far world and sin and though it's alluring and though it's lustful and though you're enticed by that, before you go, let me say this to you as your preacher, let me tell you this, at the far country has consumed many a young man and many a young lady that hasn't been able to get back to the far. Father, and as a preacher, can I just say to you, don't go. Don't go. Wicked men and wicked women long for some son or some daughter to say, you know what? My dad doesn't know. My mom doesn't know. They don't know what they're talking about. The preacher doesn't know. The, the, the world is filled with people that have a whole lot more experience than you and I do who are good at taking people and manipulating them and destroying their lives. And you can sit here in this room and say, well, I know about the world and they'll still eat your lunch because you can't control that thing. 
They're looking for somebody who wants to leave the father's house and come and waste it with them only to laugh at them all the way to the hog pen while they're still slopping hogs. And there's people out there today. Listen to me. Some of you sitting here know people who used to be in church and now they're slopping the hogs of this world. Don't go. No matter how sweet the words, no matter how much you can't stand the preacher or the father or the mama or the daddy or the examples or are doing what's right, how, no matter how much you want to get out of here, don't go to the far country. The far country is consumed and destroyed. So many people and lost so many tragedies. The father waits for his son to come home. But many a time, let me say this to you, in this story, though the father waits and he comes home, Many a time a father has waited until he died and never seen the, father, seen the son come home. You read about the older son. <clears throat> he sees the end of the younger son. He heeds the wisdom that he's learned. He sees the value in staying behind, behind and working in, working hard and putting in the long days. But there's still a problem in his character. He's still selfish. <laughs> He still thinks that he deserves something from the father because after all, I didn't leave. Can I just tell you the, son, the younger son or the older son who stayed home, he was always getting what the father was giving him. He always had a house. He always had the blessings of the father. And you know what happened to him? He took those things for granted. That's the problem. The older son, the elder son sought his father's blessing from the point of self-righteousness and selfishness. He didn't have to do anything to get his father's blessing. It was there all the time. It was his and his father said, if you read the end of this chapter, when the older son comes to the father and says, you didn't do this for me. You know what the father says? Listen, all that I have is thine. He said, you still have it all. I want you to see something though, before we, we get to the end of this message here today is this. This story is not about the older son or the younger son. We make it about that often. But this story is about the father. <laughs> That's what this whole story is about. You see, the father was there before the son left. And he doesn't say what he did or said. But the, the, son, had this, the son had this father who cared about him. And I guarantee you, he may have done some things wrong. He may not have trained them exactly right. But I'll just tell you something. He didn't want him to go to the far country. He didn't want him to waste everything that he had given him. That's embarrassing. <laughs> if for no other reason, the father would say, I don't want to be able to tell everybody my son has gone astray and is off in the rock somewhere. He didn't want to say when somebody walked up and said, hey, how you doing? Hey, where's your boy at nowadays? To say, well, he's in the far country slopping hogs because he wouldn't listen. He didn't want to have to do that. I guarantee you no father wants to uh, talk about a son who's gone off the rails. But they got this selfishness somewhere. Maybe, maybe daddy didn't lead them right at some point. I don't know. I know this. Some fathers don't seem to know how to lead their kids. He left it up to maybe, maybe he said, mama, you take care of them. This is, I got things I got to do. But I'll just tell you, a mother by herself without the Lord is the only half of the influence that the kids need. The kids need mom and dad, dad. The kids don't need just dad and the kids don't need just mom. They need both of them. And the devil does a good job at knocking that thing in two. Amen. Where's the leaderships, dad? Where's the dad teaching his children the character and determination to do what's right and to do the hard thing, to make myself do what I'm supposed to do? That's what character is. Character is making yourself do what you don't want to do. Where's that in a dad teaching his children? Where's the testimony that dads have of being godly men? <laughs> Listen to me. You're not going to teach your kids to be godly hanging out with the world. <laughs> I don't care what you're saying. I don't care. Well, I'm, I'm trying to be a good influence on them. You're not going to be a good influence on the bar at the bar. Amen. <laughs> you, know how you, you know how you be a good influence on the bar? Don't go there. Amen. You will never influence this world and try to get them to come to Jesus by acting and being like them. They are, they're going to do what they want to do. Amen. You know, I, I get frustrated about this kind of stuff because you and I, we react under pressure. We're, we're creatures of pressure. What's your testimony when you're under pressure? 
What does it take to keep you from church? What does it take to keep you from leaving for the Lord, from reading your Bible? How often do the kids see you reading that Bible in prayer? How much trouble are you going to go to to get the gospel out to people around you? Listen, you're going to be known for something when you die. Your kids are going to know something about you. And when they stand up and give your eulogy or your memorial service or whatever it is, you know what you want them to say? My dad loved Jesus Christ more than anything else. That's a testimony. Amen? There was a fellow named James Ryle. He told a story as a pastor. He said when he was two years old, his father was sent to prison. And when he was seven, the authorities put him in an orphanage. And at 19, he had a car wreck that killed a friend. He sold drugs to raise money for his legal fee and the law caught up to him. And he was arrested and charged with a felony and he was sent to prison. While in prison, this man named James, he said, I accepted Christ. And he's, he served his time. He eventually went into the ministry. And years later, he sought out his father to reconcile with him. When they got together, the conversation turned to prison life. And James's father asked, which prison were you in? James told him and his father was taken back. He said, I helped build that prison. He said, I have been a welder who went from place to place building penitentiaries. And this fellow named James Ryle said, I was in the prison that my father built. And I'm going to tell you something, you men in here, you build an example. Your example is going to build a place for your children. And it's either going to be a home or it's going to be a prison. That's the truth. Maybe dad got saved late in life. I don't know. Maybe he got away from the Lord at some point. Maybe he got right when the boys were older after they had learned their character. I don't know. We're teaching children, uh, train up a child class on 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. I wish I had a thousand men sitting there listening on how to raise their kids. Not because I'm right, but because God's word is right. I wish I had some people there that would be willing to listen. It's in the children's years, in, in the child years, in the, in, the, in the years that they're from about 2 to 10, that you better train your kids. I'm not talking about as a baby. I'm not talking about as a little child. He said train up a child in the way he should go. It's so important that as a child they learn the ways of God. And whatever, whatever dad was like, whatever the father was like, I'm just going to say this to you. I don't care what your dad was like. I don't care how bad he was. You have an obligation before God to honor your father. You say, well, my dad was a bum. <laughs> And I understand we don't have many good fathers nowadays overall. I understand many a father has dropped the ball. I understand we have some fathers who were wicked men and thereby emulate the devil who was their spiritual father. And I'm not saying I'm a perfect father. Anybody is. We all make mistakes. We all fail at times. But it's a man of God who loves God who gets back up and says, I'm sorry, and tries to make things right. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about a good father. But there are some fathers out there, they weren't, they're not fit to raise a hog. <laughs> they're not fit to raise a child. Amen. Your father may have beat you and abused you and had no desire to be around you. Can I just tell you, a, a pedophile's not a good father. Amen. You ought to hear a resounding amen. And if you can't say amen to that, something's wrong with you. A pedophile is not a good father. Amen. Amen. <laughs> You say, well, we should love them. No, we shouldn't love them. We should say, stay away from us. We don't trust you. Amen. Amen. You say, well, I think we are. Get over yourself. Amen. Learn how to handle things the way the word of God says. Amen. Amen. You know somebody that's gone down that road, you tell them, get right with God, but make sure you stay away from me. I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. Amen. That's the truth. We're living in a society of pervertedness nowadays. And it's reached into the church where people say, well, you just got to forgive them. I can forgive them, but I ain't going to trust them. That's the truth. Amen. And I feel sorry for some people who have been through some things and their upbringing, their fathers molested them. I know some kids whose fathers didn't provide for them, who didn't care for their needs emotionally or spiritually. We have a, such a screwed up society nowadays. I don't know how you can hardly honor such men sometimes. But I know this, you can tell them the truth. You may be ready to forgive them and let that thing go and turn it over to God so you can honor them in that respect. 
But I don't know what you should do. That's for God, for God to show you if you'll humble yourself and say, God, I want to follow your command. But to com- the command to honor your father is not given to you because your father deserves it. It's because God said, do it. That's the reality. You may honor someone who doesn't deserve it by putting them in a position of your submission and whether they deserve it or not, your honor to God is because you voluntarily submit to him and obey him. That's what David did with Saul. Saul shouldn't have been king. He was a wicked man, but David said, I know I'm going to be king one day, but right now I'm not, and he's the one God has there. That's a hard thing to do. And I'm just going to say this to you. That's not the problem with the prodigal son and his brother. (laughs) I want you to see a couple of things the prodigal's father didn't do. In this story, you've got the picture of the father. He's like God the father. You've got the older brother, and doctrinally, he represents Judah, who stays around God longer. But spiritually, he's like a Christian who's a Pharisee. You've got the younger brother who doctrinally is like the the other half of the nation of Israel that went astray, who went out into sin, and the the Lord's illustration of of him is him coming back to to the father. Spiritually, he's like a a good example. The prodigal is a good example of a Christian who's gone astray who's coming back home. His character was that he loved his son. That's the father. The kid's character was that he loved his son. And a father that loves his son doesn't want him to go to the far country. You read in uh, Proverbs, all through Proverbs, where Solomon talks to his son, and 23 times he addresses him as, my son, my son, my son. He loves his son. And if you read Proverbs, you see over and over again where he's saying, look, it's better for you to do this than to do that. He says, stay away from the strange woman. Stay away from alcohol. So he tells him all these different things. Why is he doing that? Because he loves his son. (laughs) He wants to keep him from the far country. I want you to know this, number one, though, about the father. He didn't stop his son from going. Let me tell you this today. God's not going to stop you from going to the far country. You have your own will. You say, I'm tired of coming to church. God's not going to stop you from from, from, doing whatever you want to do. You ought to to see the things that the pastor sees while he's preaching. When I say those kind of things, and it's amazing how some people, they, they don't have any respect or love for the word of God. It's amazing when you say that kind of stuff, people are like, oh, yeah, whatever, okay, whatever. I'm just going to tell you, God will let you go live like the devil if you want to live like the devil. Amen. He's not willing that many, any should perish, right? Amen. But they do. He says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. But they don't. Jesus says, come unto me. Get right with God. Quit being so stinking rebellious against me. Get down here at this altar and let's get things right. But they don't. He didn't stop him from going to the far country. Number two, let me just say this. He didn't pursue him when he went. And I'm going to tell you this. God's not going to pursue you to the far country either. Many a young man, I want you to turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Many a young man or young lady has made a decision. I'm going to the far country. And the Lord says, I love you. I don't want you to go. But I can't go there. They don't love me there. <laughs> they don't want me there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, this is a passage, and I'm just saying to you today, there's some people sitting here, maybe right now, in your own heart, all week long, all weekend long, you're coming to church right now, maybe you're just miserable because I'm preaching what I'm preaching, but I'm going to tell you something, God is not a uniter, he is a divider. He is going to divide you from the world if you're going to follow him. He is not part of the far country or of their ideas. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not. That means don't do this, right? Did y'all see that? Be ye not unequally yoked together with who? You got to be careful, especially about spiritual things and try to help people in their lives when you're doing it with unbelievers. He said, don't do that. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. What are you doing fellowshipping with people that don't love your Savior? 
I didn't talk. You say, well, how do we tell them about Jesus? You walk up and say, here's a gospel track. Let me tell you about Jesus. But fellowship is to sit down with a meal with them. Fellowship is to sit down and drink with them, to smoke with them, to talk with them, to have friends with them. That's not Jesus. Jesus is who he was. People came to him for help. He didn't go to them to enjoy their company. There's a difference. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? That's the difference. If you're saved, the light of Jesus Christ is inside of you. And if you are light, darkness don't like you. Amen. I hope you're saying amen. I hope you understand where I'm coming here from. There's a difference between a Christian and a lost person. There's a difference between somebody trying to live for the Lord and the world. There's a difference. And it's, it, it's not just the, we're not just talking about the heart. We're talking about the physical actions as well. Look what he says in verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? That's our name for the devil. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What are you doing hanging out with atheists? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, and God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So what should I do now that I'm saved and the Holy Spirit's living inside of me? What should I do as a Christian? What should I do when it comes to the far country? Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them and what? Be ye separate. separate. He didn't say, go hang out with them and try to get them to come to church. No, he said, you go tell them about Jesus. Go tell them, invite them to church. But he didn't say for you to be a part of them. He said, be ye what? Separate. Separate. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Why am I telling you this? Because what the father didn't do was say... Well, son, I'll come down and visit you in the far country. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, but you can leave the ways of godliness. You can leave the blessings and the peace of God. And he's not going to say, I condone your sin and it's okay for you to do what you're doing. We live in a world today where the popular thing to say is this. God will accept me the way that I am especially this month. I want you to understand something. God will accept you as a sinner repenting the way you are, but he's going to change you to be something that you are not. Amen. Amen. And if your mindset is God will accept me the way that I am and I can continue in my sin, I'm going to tell you, you are sadly terribly wrong. He will not pursue you to the far country. I'll tell you another one. When he came home, he didn't shun him. God's always ready to forgive. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is always ready to to reconcile and cleanse you and clean you up when you're ready to leave your sin. He's always ready to forgive. You say, but you don't understand, preacher. I just mess up again and again and again. Yeah, and he's always ready to forgive every single time. Some of you, I, I want to I preach this to you for just a minute. I'm going to park right here for just a second. Haven't somebody offended you and you got mad and you were told to forgive them and you said, I just can't do that. Can I just say to you, you need to forgive them just as many times as Jesus forgave you. Not one time more. You don't have to forgive them any more than Jesus forgave you. Right? Don't you, after you're saved, haven't you gone to the Lord this week and said, Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up. How many of you have done that? Would you raise your hand? Now, I want you to keep them up. How many of you... It wasn't the first time you did it either. Are you with me? You said, God, I am so sorry. I screwed up again. And the Lord says, okay, I'll forgive you. And then five minutes later, you're saying, Lord. And he says, again. 
and he's always ready to forgive. I say that to you because, listen, if you just forsake your sin and come back to the Father, he's there for you. He's not going to shun you when you are ready to leave your sin. He's ready to forgive. This boy, when you find what you read in verse 20, is that the father was waiting for the boy to come home. He didn't pursue him to the far country. He didn't condone his sin. He didn't send him a care package. But he sure was waiting when he came back. And he took him in when he came home. The Bible said there in verse 22, you read about his, his attitude towards this boy in verse 22. This is what he says. Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hands and and shoes on his feet. See, what's he doing? He's taking him back. I want to say this to you also. One of the downsides of somebody going to the far country, even those that return, is even though he returned, he did not restore what he had lost. You say, why? It was gone. I mean, the father had worked all those years and maybe it had been passed down through the years. And what he gave his son, he put it in his hand and he entrusted him with it. And when the son blew it, it was gone. You know what the Bible tells us is that we have rewards in heaven for living for the Lord. And there are some things there you can't lose. You can't lose your mansion. You can't lose your eternal life. But I'm going to tell you something. You can lose rewards. As a matter of fact, in 2 John, he says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. I want you to understand there are consequences into eternity and in this life for walking away from God and his plan for your life. There's this mindset that if, well, if I just come back to Jesus, he'll make everything right and everybody will forgive me for the stupidity I've had. Can I just tell you, they might forgive you, but they might never forget it. That's the truth. God loves you. He wants to restore the relationship you have with him. That's what's valuable. The mindset that he's going to give me stuff is wrong. Who do you love? Do you love him or do you love the stuff? Amen. Amen. I'm trying, I'm trying to help you and into the church in Laodicea timeline, there has been some really bad, dumb philosophies that have sunk into people and they're never live for God because of it. They got this idea. Oh, if I go to church, God's going to give me this. Or if I be good, God's going to help me with that. God loves you and he'll give you things because he loves you. Not because you are nothing. Amen. We're not worthy of the grace. We're not worthy of the mercy. He just loves you. (laughs) And there's an accumulation of the blessings of God by staying around the Father's house. And I'll just tell you, if you leave the Father's house, you can lose every bit of it. And God's not going to magically appear and let you win the lottery and have it all back. Amen. That's the truth. As a Christian, you need to realize that there's a thing called the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says that that judgment, if you do things that are down here on this earth, that are the the works you do are wood, hay, and stubble, you will suffer loss. You may not have anything to show for this life. He didn't lose his love for his son. That's the next one I want you to know. He didn't restore him what he had lost, but I want you to know he didn't lose his love for his son. You know what the father could have done after his son left is he could have said this. I've lost my my son. There's no way we're going to be able to keep this farm without the extra help. I just will just sell it and I'll move somewhere. And when the son came home, there was nothing there. Somebody else answered the door. But it wasn't that case. You know what he was when he came home? He always had loved his son. He fell on it. He saw him a great way off. He ran and hugged him. You say, why? He never lost his love for his son. I'm saying that to you today because if you're here, the Lord loves you. As a sinner, he wants to save you. But if you're far away from him because you're not living for God, he still loves you. He still wants you back. His love never fails. And for the backslider who goes into the far country, your father still loves you. Did you hear me? Hey, prodigal, the father still loves you. He's still at home. He still waits for you. He's still praying for you. 
I've seen some Christians, whenever they went through troubles and trials, boy, they were on their knees and they were praying and they were reading their Bible. And then when things didn't work out the way they wanted to, they got mad at God. And maybe they didn't do it physically, but inside their heart and their mind, they're as far into the far country as they can get. You're there today, sitting in church today, that can be you. And I want you to know the Father still loves you. And he still wants you back. He still wants your relationship to be right with him. This father raised his kids the way that he raised them. Obviously, both of these sons have problems with selfishness. The younger one says, give me. The older one is mad because he feels like he deserves something. The older one, older son forgot that the father had a desire to have a relationship with him, that there was forgiveness and unconditional love for him. And his younger brother, he forgot about that. The advantage of the prodigal son was that his father was there. And the end of the story, he's still there. He's waiting to forgive him. He's waiting to welcome him home. In Psalms chapter 86, he says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Listen to that verse again. Listen to this. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. I ask you a question. Where are you at today? The purpose of this story is teaching about the, not just about how this prodigal can come home, but the rejoicing of heaven and God's people when someone comes to a place of repentance and seeks forgiveness of the, uh, of the, like the prodigal did. It's the forgiveness of the father that this story is about. The Bible says that salvation is repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just saying, well, I'm sorry, God. It's saying, I'm sorry but I'm going to do something about this sin to rid myself of it. You hear me? And I don't know about you, but every day as a Christian can be a repeat of yesterday. You say, what do you mean? I mean the same temptation that easily besets us. Is there anything that easily besets you? That's what the, I mean, listen, I know there is. We're all sinners. <laughs> There are some things that you can do that I can't do, that things that I could do that maybe you can't do. But I'm just going to say every one of us in here has something that every day can, we can come back to the Lord and say, Lord, I did it again. Amen. And if you let that go long enough, it'll weigh on you and drag you down and the world will mess your mind, with your mind. And it may even drag you out into further and further sin. But I want you to know something. If you'll just come back to the Father, he still loves you and wants to have fellowship with you. That's our heavenly father. The advantage of the prodigal was that the father was still there. Repentance toward God, saying, I'm sorry, and I'm going to go from the hog pen and go back to the father today. I realize there's some people listening here today that didn't have a father that was worth shooting, as they say. <laughs> and I'm sorry for you. You don't know what you missed. I will tell you that. The role of a father is so important. A godly Christian man who understands that position as a child of God can give more real love than anything on this earth. And I'll just tell you, it's amazing what the Christian man can do. Uh, uh, ladies, if you want, to, you want love from your husband, pray that he'll get closer to the Lord. Because if you'll get him close to the Lord, he'll learn to love more. If God gets a hold of his heart, he'll love you better than you've ever dreamed you could be loved. And if you're a saved man today, you got in on your salvation because God loved you in spite of what he knew we were like. I realize you have and you're going to sin and you're going to disappoint people. And I'll tell you, you'll disappoint God again and again and again included in anything that you want to name but where is an, there is an unconditional love that if you'll come to the Father, he will forgive you no matter what you've done or where you've been. He loves me like I was his only child. Never felt so loved before. I could never ask for more. He loves me like I was his only child. God really loves me. Yes, he really loves me. He loves me like I was his only child. 
No matter what you've done or where you've been, it's like one great big family, the song says. No matter how long ago, no matter how short of a time ago, no matter how egregious, no matter what else you've done, I'll tell you, the Lord will forgive you. You just need to come home. Can I say to you, come home? Can I say to you, backslider, prodigal, come home? Maybe you've got some kids or some family that have gone astray. Tell them, come home. The Father loves you. You will not do anything standing in your self-righteousness. You'll only make, it'll only make you bitter at those things and those people that the Father blesses and loves. I've seen some Christians, get just they're sitting in church and they look at me, what are they so happy about? You know why they're happy? Because their sins are forgiven. They're back in fellowship with the Father. It's a joy to be around his table. It's a joy to come to the altar and talk with him. Amen? And there's some people that they're just mad all the time. And you're going to have to take your place with the prodigal and realize you didn't get in on the blessing of God because you did something or because you deserve something. It's, 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 it's the attitude of the prodigal. It's, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the Lord will interrupt you in the middle of that and say, listen, I'm going to put a, a new robe on you. I'm going to kill the fatted calf. I'm just glad you're coming home. Would you do that today? I want you to stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed as Brittany comes. And I'm going to ask you, would you humble yourself before God today? I, I realize some of you, maybe you wouldn't listen to me. Maybe you have no use for what I'm saying. Maybe you're just going to stay in the far country. You haven't hit the hog pen yet, maybe. But I want, you to, I want to invite you today to come to this altar and pray if you want to. I want you to come down here and thank God for his, his goodness to you if you want to. I want, you to, I want to invite you to come and pray for your kids maybe if you want to. I don't know. I don't know what your, what your needs are today, but I want you to know we have a great heavenly father. And there's forgiveness for anybody that would come. There's forgiveness that awaits you. The father was there before you left. He's there waiting for you now. You can come home. The question is, will you come home? Would you come and pray for your kids? Maybe you ought to come and pray for your own father. Maybe your father is not saved. Would you come? Would you come and pray and say, Lord, help them? Maybe you've enabled them to stay in the, har- in the far country. Maybe you need to make some decisions on that. I'm not going to help them no more with that. Would you come? Would you come down here to this altar and say, Lord, I need your help. I've messed up again. I don't know why you need to come. But I know this, we can all come and say, Lord, thank you for being a good father. Father, please help us today.